First launched in the beginning of the 1960s, the Ranger program served as a testbed for future craft that were to explore and survey the moon. And although it was known to NASA engineers that failures would most likely occur, it is still a great example of just how many small leaps lay ahead for NASA and the American government before they would place their man on the moon. Originally designed in 1959, Ranger's main goal was to quickly and effectively advance the technology of U.S. spacecraft, mainly craft to map the moon's surface. To put this time frame into perspective, only one year before, in January, the first successful man-made satellite, Sputnik 1, descended back to Earth after about three months in a low Earth orbit. Its success was a huge propaganda win for the Soviets and the countries of the USSR. However, its success would come at a cost. Sputnik was simple, extremely simple. Consisting of little more than a radio and batteries, NASA and the US understood that if they, or the Russians for that matter, were to expand into interplanetary space, they would need much more complicated and thusly much more unreliable systems. With this issue in mind, the Ranger program was born, and after several delays, including one where Ranger 1's mission timer started on the launch pad, deploying its solar panels while still in its known scone, Ranger 1 would launch on August 23, 1961. Unfortunately though for NASA, its first six missions would end in failure, but with that failure also came knowledge. Rangers 7, 8, and 9 would all successfully send back thousands of images of the moon's surface, completing the goals of the $170 million program, over $1 billion in today's money. The Atlas LV-3A, like most rockets at the time, or launch vehicles if you wish, was a modified ballistic missile of military design, and originally intended to carry nuclear warheads instead of spacecraft. It consisted of three main sections, with the Atlas being the lower booster and the first stage, while at the top sat a Gina with Ranger tucked carefully inside the uppermost section. The two large side engines at the bottom of Atlas make up the booster engines. They are housed in their own section of Atlas and make up the wide ring at the bottom of the rocket at launch. They have dual LR-895 engines and burn for 2 minutes and 25 seconds, producing 307,740 pounds of thrust. After the booster's burn time expired, the section with the two boosters was ejected out the bottom of the first stage, whose single engine continued to burn, freed of the fuel in the booster section used to punch through the thickest part of the atmosphere. The first stage, called the LV-3A sustainer, was the main body of the rocket. It featured one LR-1055 sustainer engine, whose 58,053 pounds of thrust made it capable of putting its Agino payload into Earth orbit. It also had two smaller LR-1015 vernier thrusters for stability and course correction. 
Those can be seen here on the sides of the main first stage rocket body. Agenia itself was made for low Earth orbit, and was the main customization to the Atlas rocket for the Ranger program. It featured a Bell Industries 8081 restartable engine that had to use a less common fuel than Atlas's jet fuel derived counterpart. However, it was also capable of burning in a vacuum, and would produce a respectable 16,027 pounds of thrust as it yeeted Ranger onwards towards the lunar surface. Alright, that's enough about Atlas. But one feature I would like to personally note about the Atlas LV-3A is its rather unique sound when its main fuel pumps spin up. The Ranger program was made up of three so-called blocks, with each block set to be more advanced than the last. This was done primarily for NASA engineers to learn and understand what type of equipment would be necessary to actually properly map the moon. Every Ranger spacecraft consisted of a standardized, hexagonal-shaped aluminum base that measured 4 feet 11 inches across and varied in height and width due to differences in solar panel design and payload. This base was also used to house most of Ranger's vital systems, in square fold-out bays used so engineers could modularly swap out and work on various equipment without needing the rest of the craft available. For their cooling, every craft in the Ranger series was passively cooled, using a combination of gold plating, chrome plating, white paint, and sometimes a silvered plastic material for some of Block 2's retro rocket systems. The Block 1 craft were very primitive. They lacked cameras or any observation instruments and were primarily intended to test Ranger's systems in both operation and reliability. They were comprised of Rangers 1 and 2, with Ranger 2 being almost completely identical to Ranger 1, with the exception of Ranger 2's fancy new gyroscope. Both had a 13-foot aluminum tower consisting of struts and girders on which one of its antennas was placed. Over time, it would eventually be confirmed that Ranger's design was indeed sturdy enough to be trusted with more advanced and also more expensive hardware, with Ranger's first two launch failures actually resulting from problems with its mechanically overcomplicated launch vehicle, the Atlas B. This situation also happens to be quite a common theme for this time period, as we will find out later here on the channel. Anyways, after Ranger's systems were nonetheless tested, NASA and the government were ready to take the next step, Block 2. Block 2 was made up of Rangers 3, 4, and 5. They still retained most of the Block 1's basic systems and overall design, but were far more capable machines. Most of this capability came in the form of scientific instruments, which now fill the outer parts of its superstructure. Many of these instruments were common on spacecraft, even at the time, but Block 2's carried a very special instrument, which we will get around to towards the end of the video. Just like with Block 1, NASA engineers working on Block 2 concluded that, when done right, even more complicated systems can be tamed and made more reliable, and even though all three missions shared the same fate as their sister craft, the less exciting ground testing was still nevertheless successful. Being made up of Rangers 6, 7, 8, and 9, they were the most cutting edge of the Rangers. The Ranger program itself had, at this point, gone from a simple testing rack to a full-fledged scientific impactor capable of sending back a magnitude of meaningful data in just a matter of a few years. And combined with the kinks being worked out of the Atlas rocket, the Block 3 spacecraft would become very successful, with all of the missions other than Ranger 6 being partially, if not fully, completed. All Rangers were designed as impactors, which means they were designed to be flung straight into a planet's surface, usually transmitting data until crashing or impacting, which gives them their name. Most craft that went to the moon at this time were impactors. Anything else would be too heavy for rockets of the day to carry the amount of fuel and equipment needed to the soft land on the moon. Some minds and people did possess this technology, however, but this is a story for another time. 
At this point, with their design purpose fulfilled, the Block 3s would be the last of the Rangers, with Ranger 9 being the last to launch on March 31st, 1965. Their design, with its hexagonal base, combined with its workbench-like nature, was to be hugely influential on other craft in the future, even with the exact base structure being used on another one of NASA's projects. As we get into the features section of the video, I would like you to keep in mind that each block of the Ranger programs consisted of sister craft, meaning that every craft in each block is exactly the same as the last. With this being taken into account, we will be talking about the differences in blocks, as opposed to the differences in crafts, on this episode. Alright, now let's explore what makes this incredible machine tick. Starting with Block 1 and 2 solar systems, they, like all other craft in the Ranger series, had two fold-down solar panels in which they used to convert sunlight into electricity. They used these panels for operating Ranger during the long period of lunar transit. These early solar cells, much like many components on the early Rangers, would also be very primitive. They made very little usable power, having a power conversion ratio of about 10% or so. They consisted of 8,680 individual cells each, and were very expensive to make, being only three years since their initial introduction to spacecraft. They produced around 150 watts of direct current electrical output, with the Block 2s requiring a slightly smaller 135 watt rated panel. Later on, Block 3 Rangers would be upgraded with a more modern, square looking panel, using 9,792 cells and being of a more advanced silicon type, now producing 200 watts. Both Rangers 1 and 2 had very poorly optimized hardware that took a lot of power to run. Because of this, both had very large 126 pound silver zinc batteries, assumed to be for supporting the craft when its power draw exceeded that of its solar panels. They also at many times had small support batteries of the same type, used to run various experiments, most likely needing different voltages or currents than the main systems could provide. These early silver zinc batteries were non-rechargeable and mainly used for short duration missions. They were well known and very durable, chosen because they can survive the vacuums and temperatures of space, even eventually being used on Apollo's lunar excursion module a whole decade later. The battery capacity and voltages of Ranger 1 and 2 are unknown, and I could not find any information other than weight and type. As systems got more efficient and being adapted to spacecraft, the bulky batteries that took up almost one-sixth of the Block 1's weight were done away with for Block 2, making way for simple, lighter batteries, thusly giving engineers some much appreciated capacity for mounting Ranger with bigger and more capable equipment. This single smaller 25 pound battery, still consisting of silver and zinc, provided more than enough power for these new systems, being more suited to a primary mission goal rather than for testing. It was used as a backup and launching battery, for example, when it's in its nose cone just before liftoff. We can infer from this small battery, and what it was used for, that Ranger can now easily power its basic low energy systems off of its solar panels alone. These Block 2 backup batteries had a capacity of around 1000 watt hours, with voltage numbers being relatively unknown. With the introduction of Block 3, its mission also introduced equipment that would need a vast amount more power than even Block 1 craft would dare to consume. For this, much more powerful and revolutionary batteries were needed. These batteries came in the form of a silver oxide type. While being similar in chemical makeup to silver zinc batteries, silver oxide provides far more energy density than silver zinc, making it far more capable of running more power hungry equipment. In addition to this, another benefit of silver oxide batteries are their ability to retain their normal power output when close to being depleted. 
This is a very good attribute for their use as an impactor, whose main instruments need a large and steady amount of energy right before a mission's end. The Block 3 Rangers would have four of these kinds of batteries, two for the science equipment and two for the ship systems, with the batteries being 1200 watt hours each for equipment and 1000 watt hours each for systems. Both of the battery systems were rated at 26.5 volts, and I think it's safe to say here that the rest of the Ranger program probably did as well. This is only an educated guess, but if anybody can confirm this, or has any information on it, please let me know in the comments. Ranger 1 and 2 had a very jack-of-all-trades vibe going on with its instruments, all of them being the same and used to gain basic data around or near the moon's surface. Many of them have ridiculous names, but they did little more than send back readings of the things that most of us recognize today. The first main instrument of the Block 1s was a type of telescope known as a Lyman Alpha Telescope. This device although sounding complicated, took readings of ultraviolet light from a considerable distance, hence its telescope designation. The second was a magnetometer, which read and relayed the condition of the electromagnetic field around the spacecraft. Thirdly was an ionization chamber. It is a simple gas field chamber that is used to measure X-rays, gamma rays, and other forms of ionizing radiation. The last main piece of equipment on Rangers 1 and 2 were a kind of radiation detector that looked for particles in the middle of the radiation spectrum, such as those from nuclear decay. The first rangers also had other secondary equipment, such as a optical rangefinder and a micrometeorite detector, alongside a electrostatic analyzer used for measuring particles at rest. With all of this equipment, many of them using lasers and requiring continuous power for accurate readings, it's no wonder why Ranger 1 and 2 needed their large aforementioned batteries. If they had been successful, this equipment would have been able to send back massive amounts of new data on the moon. Ranger 3 and the rest of Block 2 were the first rangers designed with the specific purpose of gathering data extremely close to lunar impact. They carried a far less varied amount of instruments than the Block 1s, but these instruments were much more customized and adapted to the role of a lunar impactor. The first of this more optimized equipment was a small orb-like device known as a gamma-ray spectrometer. This instrument was mounted on a flip-down boom that was around 6 feet in length, and deployed once the spacecraft was free in orbit. As its name suggests, the gamma-ray spectrometer measures gamma radiation, but can measure its whole spectrum, or wavelength, at any given time. Secondly, the Block 2s had a single RCA Viticon camera. This was a kind of television camera, which used a special type of vacuum tube known as a Viticon tube. These Viticon tubes were made especially for television cameras, and were initially developed years before Ranger. However, these tiny tubes were still experimental at the time, preceding commercial Viticon tubes by at least a year, and also being capable of capturing and transmitting low-light images every 10 seconds. This camera had the ability to quickly capture high-resolution images in low-light conditions, and being that it was small and relatively efficient, it would be perfect for the testing nature on which the Rangers were based. The third was a radar altimeter, this was for telling Ranger how far away from the moon's surface it was, and in this way it could trigger its cameras or other systems at planned heights for the best results. Block 2's fourth and largest instrument we will save for last. It and the rest of the Block 2's had no success, but I think it was one of the most interesting features fitted to the Ranger program, even, in my opinion at least, beating out the incredible Block 3's. 
Moving on to the Block 3s, they had one mission and one mission alone, to get lunar images as close to impact as possible. And with the previous failures still fresh on everyone's mind, only one realistically achievable lunar impact. They would focus on the terrain of the moon and its geography, stripping away all unnecessary components until leaving it only with its Viticon camera system. To obtain the highest possible level of success, NASA engineers would employ a method of redundancy and fail safing to all Block 3. Its equipment layout was made more for results, and getting those results without fail. Every Block 3 Ranger was fitted with not two, not four, but six Viticon cameras. Further increasing this redundancy was the camera's power system, whose system was split into two completely separated parts. Consisting of one battery and three cameras each, they also included a separated 60 watt communication system for making sure transmission was redundant as well. Each set of cameras also contained one wide angle and two narrow angle lenses to still give the maximum amount of detail should one of the systems go down. Each one of the camera pairs also fired one after the other as to keep their temperatures and batteries in good condition. The Ranger team and its cameras would finally have their day when Ranger 7 would, on July 31st, 1964, take the United States' first close-up images of the lunar surface. The engines, or rocket motor, thruster, whatever you may prefer, of the Rangers was pretty standard for most craft of its type, with all of them having some small form of thrusters powered by nitrogen for tilting and rotating the spacecraft. All Rangers had 12 nozzles on the various ends of the spacecraft. I don't really have stats on these nozzles, but we can assume the thrust wasn't very much. Beginning with Block 2, the Rangers would be upgraded with a small single fuel motor that was capable of 5,080 pounds of thrust, which corrected its mid-flight course and gave it much better accuracy when hitting certain points on the moon. The Block 1s did not have these engines. They simply spun themselves for limited sideways movement and had no viable means to slow themselves before impact. The Block 2 and 3s did have this capability, however, and the Block 3s would make great use of it when succeeding in sending back its pictures. This allowed it to make relatively quick movements and corrections when compared to its predecessors. This was about the extent of the Ranger's pretty limited propulsion systems. It didn't do very much, but it didn't really need to, with its trajectory mainly being handled by Agena, aiming it to its impact site once in zero gravity space. Starting with Block 1, Rangers 1 and 2 had extremely basic navigation systems. With the previously mentioned Agena systems designed to set its course, the Block 1s were very much along for the ride, if you will. They consisted of two basic sensors that resisted and sent out varied voltages depending on what it was looking at. These sensors were also split into different electrical connections, one for each of the different directions the craft would need to go. These connections would then feed into Ranger's RCS, 
or reaction control system. In Block 1's case being a very rudimentary logic relay type. This type of control was far simpler than a full computer and sent commands depending on the incoming voltage levels. After this, the RCS would then send commands to the thrusters when needed. These two sensors were a sun sensor and a earth sensor, each of which can be broken down into easily understandable components. All rangers would have these two types of sensors, but others would have better navigation systems, which we will get into. Without these sensors input their signals being established, and how Block 1's RCS reads them, I think it will become clear how the Block 1 Rangers did not compute things like we think of today, and was far more analog than one might expect. Each of these main sensors had four aligned sensing points that correlated to each of the movements for the craft systems, tilting it up or down, or turning it side to side. These are also the individual voltages that the RCS uses to determine when and which of its systems to turn on or off. Beginning with the Earth sensor, it was basically four long-range thermal sensors. They used a similar process to our modern-day temperature readers that are used in the construction industries, with Ranger sensor output directly going to its antenna positioning relays instead of being calculated with a computer. The Earth's information on the Block 1 Rangers was simply set as voltage numbers in its relays, going off when certain values were under or over exceeded. The Sun sensors on the Rangers would work in a very similar way to its Earth sensors, but it would use a very different device and a very different method of staying with the Sun. These Sun sensors would use a something that the vast majority of us know, and have already seen before, a photo sensor. Being commonly seen in many night lights and outdoor floodlights, these devices usually trigger a switch when they sense light has dropped below a certain level. The photo sensors on the rangers do exactly this, but with its switching being done by the RCS. The four of these sun sensors are also housed in a protruding spike coming from a curved mirrored plate. This plate funnels the sun's light to a point directed at the spike containing the photo sensors. By doing this layout, whenever the sun's light starts to veer away from any of the photo sensors, the ones dropping into the shadow will be triggered by the RCS, directing the craft. With the introduction of Block 2 and 3's mission, alongside its new correction engine, came a need for a smarter guidance system, capable of knowing where it will land on the moon. This time around, NASA would need a real computer this time. It would come in the form of a solid-state guidance computer, having limited data and no hard drives. It would still nevertheless be capable of crashing Ranger in a more accurate manner. There is really not much data on this computer, but we can assume that it is far less powerful than Apollo's computers, and also lacked Apollo's computer's task managing capability. But as I said earlier though, it doesn't really need that stuff anyways. The Block 2 and 3 craft would also have multiple and redundant Sun and Earth sensors, with both having six Sun sensors and one Earth sensor, and a gyroscope for secondary navigation. To start off with, all rangers in blocks 1 and 2 had a large flip-out high-gain dish in which they used to communicate to Earth. High-gain antennas are used to send back photos or large volumes of data and need to be pointed within a fraction of a degree towards Earth to work properly. With addition to having a very narrow angle, high-gain systems also usually require more power so as their information is clear and readable after traveling through space. With blocks 1 and 2 using a 3 watt transmitter to send and receive instrument data with ground teams back on Earth. 
All of the Rangers were also equipped with a low gain antenna, mainly used for sending out the status and the health of the craft, or to receive emergency commands. They were used at a very low output of one fourth of a watt, periodically sending its fitness data back to the NASA cloud. They also made up a fairly recognizable part of the spacecraft, being the finished metal cap-like component on the very top of the craft, with the Block 3s getting a slightly more powerful 3-watt low-gain transmitter. One other thing about the Block 3 that was different was its main high-gain antenna, being much smaller and whose dish was also solid. This antenna, like almost all of Block 3, was to support its camera system, which used its pair of powerful, redundant 60-watt transmitters to send its photo scans out very quickly, capable of sending its last full image two tenths of a second before impact. It would even be fed and updated live to the country's national television networks. Some of you may have noticed that, while Block 3 and its tower was fitted with cameras, and Block 1 had its hollow tower, the Block 2 and its tower were replaced with a very odd looking structure. This structure was Block 2's lunar impacting capsule, and it was designed to impact the moon's surface at, hopefully, around 100 miles per hour. This happened right after the spacecraft separated from the capsule with the capsule using its own retro rocket to slow its impact as much as possible. When we take a look inside this capsule, it will get even more strange, with the first device on it being a seismometer, or an earthquake detector, with this detector instead measuring moonquakes. I could not find much about the inner workings of this seismograph, but it must have been very complicated to make it work correctly, having to survive lunar impact and still be capable of sensing fine movements afterwards. Its main shell was made up of 100% balsa wood, being deemed the most suitable material of the time. In testing, it would also be found that this balsa wood, not surprisingly, had terrible thermal efficiency for space. To correct this, the capsule would later be given its very iconic stripe pattern on its paint job, being used to keep its temperatures from varying too much. It also contains six small silver cadmium batteries. These batteries are very similar to nickel cadmium batteries, which are used in most modern households previous to our lithium ion technology we have now. I couldn't find anything about voltage or capacity numbers for this little guy, but I do know that it was designed to at least last for 30 days. The moonquake detector itself was also housed around fluids, similar to an animal's brain, that would then spread the forces of the impact evenly against the surface of the device, greatly increasing its survivability. It was also encased in two fluids from what I can tell, the first outer section being a very dense liquid freon that also acted as a temperature control, and the inner one being a lightly denser water. It also sent out its readings through a low-gain 50 milliwatt transmitter using a very small whip-like antenna. Well guys, I think that about wraps it up for the first episode about the Ranger series. I just want to say that I'm hugely grateful for anyone and everyone who's watched this. This is my first video doing this and I'm very proud to say that I do all of it. It is a huge personal thank you from me for giving me a shot at teaching you guys about a thing I love very, very much. With that being said, I really felt like the Ranger series was a perfect starting point for the channel in terms of the time frame and technology, and I've really grown to love its clever little design features as I look much of this stuff up. The Rangers were like really simple, but also really advanced at the same time, and that's what kind of drew me into making the first video about it. I should also mention that this was also the start of NASA's peanut tradition, where they kept a jar of peanuts for good luck, after Ranger 7's mission trajectory engineer, Dick Wallace, 
handed out peanuts to the crew, and he was later quoted as saying, I thought passing out peanuts might be something to take the crew's edge off. The rest is history. NASA would also continue this tradition to this day, with the jar being last seen in Perseverance's control room. So here next Saturday on the channel, I will have a preview for my next video. So if you like to see that and like want to stick around or check back sometime for the preview or the next episode, I would truly and hugely appreciate that. Thank you guys and have an amazing day.